Uh, our next talk will be by Daniel Ritchie, Probabilistic Programming for Computer Graphics. Great, thank you for the introduction. So I, um, I'm a, my background is actually in computer graphics, and so it, it's always a little curious uh, how exactly I got into computer, uh, to, to probabilistic programming, and why that makes sense to be a thing to use for graphics. So um, since, many, since this may be unfamiliar to many of you, I'm going to spend a little bit of this talk uh, explaining that. So uh, I'll start with this quote. This is one that I, I really like. Um, so the difficulty of generating images has been overwhelmed by a 5,000-fold performance uh, improvement in price performance of computing. So what remains hard is modeling. Right? The grand challenges in three-dimensional graphics are to make simple modeling easy and to make complex modeling accessible for far more people. So this quote is from Bob Sproul, who was one of the early graphics pioneers. He worked with Ivan Sutherland on the Sword of Damocles project here at MIT in the 60s, one of the very, very first ever uh, head-mounted virtual reality display. He co-wrote the first ever computer graphics textbook. So um, suffice it to say, the guy knows what he's talking about. And he said this back in 1990, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and this largely remains true today, that, that rendering, the process of taking three-dimensional graphical stuff and putting on the screen, is largely a solved problem at this point. And what remains hard is actually making the stuff to render. So what do I mean by the fact that, that rendering is solved? So uh, here's an example. This is a, a, a screenshot uh, of a web page from Wayfair.com, which some of you may know. It's, a, it's an online-only uh, furniture retailer, essentially. And one of the inter interesting things about, about their company, and this is not unique to them. There's other companies in their space that do this as well. Uh, this image uh, is actually not a photograph. This is computer generated. And so probably if I hadn't primed you to think that, you probably wouldn't even notice anything. It seems fairly photorealistic. It turns out that it's just much more, um, much more uh, efficient and flexible to uh, have artists go in and virtually sort of set dress these, these uh, rooms and virtually photograph them than it is to actually build them in the real world. And so it's actually quite simple, assuming you have the, the, the content, these, this, the geometry, the materials all set up. There's software that you can just get and right out of the box tweak a few knobs, press a button, and wait for, well, sometimes several hours, but get back a really, really nice photorealistic result. So this is, this is a, a pretty much, at this point, I would say kind of a solved problem. Um, but making the things to render is still really hard. If you wanted to go in and actually create the geometry of the, um, the beds or the, the dressers or, say, a couch in this particular case, uh, you need to fire up a tool like Autodesk Maya, which is going to it uh, takes quite a long time to, uh, to pick up the, the, the knack of actually working with it. You get a lot of specialized training. It's difficult. It's tedious. It takes a long time. Um, so we'd like to make these kinds of uh, creative processes more accessible to more people. So, um, so what are we doing? Like, what, what's, what's, the, what's the approach that we're taking? Well, maybe one thing you could look at is say, um, maybe AI can come to our rescue. Like, what we'd like to do is somehow take the user's intent uh, in terms of what they'd like to create. Maybe they express that in terms of examples of, of types of things they'd like to build, like I like this chair, I don't like this chair. Um, perhaps rough sketches, things that people can produce without a lot of specialized training. Um, maybe even natural language, things like, uh, you know, I'd like a, a stainless steel stool to go in a modern kitchen, for example. Uh, or, you know, other kinds of, other kinds of intent. Feed that to some kind of AI system that can then spit out graphics content that satisfies those properties. So maybe that's 3D objects like this table. Maybe it's 3D scenes composed of those objects. Other kinds of uh, visual designs people are interested in, like web pages or fashion, other things of that nature. And so if we look at this problem statement that I've just posed, OK, given the intent, please produce graphics content that satisfies that intent. Uh, you can think of that as an inference problem, right? We're trying to reason backwards. Um, from uh, the properties we'd like the, the content to satisfy to how it got created. Um, so you might think that this is something that probabilistic programming could be, could be useful for. Uh, I thought that. I thought, it, I thought it enough to do a PhD thesis on it anyway. Um, so, so what are the ways that, that, that PPLs can be useful in graphics, have been or could be hypothetically? Uh, there's three uh, areas that I'll, I'll focus on. The first is kind of as I mentioned, as sort of an, an inference engine for this inverse design process. Another way they can be useful is as a representation of learnable generative models. We like to learn some kind of uh, process or program, as we're all familiar with, that can generate visual content for us. 
And the last one, um, and this is not unique to, uh, to graphics in any sense, I'm sure that we'll be he hearing more about this from Dustin in his talk, which is gonna follow mine, that they can be a really useful tool for structuring super complex computations involving lots of deep neural networks, which we do a lot of in graphics these days. Uh, so just on this first point about um, inference for inverse design, one of, my, one of the first examples of this that I saw that I was super impressed by uh, is this, this project called Metropolis Procedural Modeling, which is I guess about seven years old now. Um, and the idea here is to say, well, if we have some kind of generative process, like in this case it's an, an L system or a, a probabilistic grammar which can generate these um, convincing looking biological tree structures, uh, what if we could say, let me place some constraint on the output of that system and then infer the, the growth process that would have actually produced that result. So here we've got trees that lo look like the shape of letters when you view them from the top down, which I thought was super cool. So, okay, so that was, uh, and this system was kind of built with um, the typical way that, that we think of the um, probabilistic inference systems being built prior to PPLs, where you have you know, model and, and inference, and they're all kind of jumbled up together. So if we were to separate you know, the, the model or the program from the inference engine, we might be able to, to swap things in and out and have a bit more flexibility. Like for example, what if we replace the, the um, Metropolis Hastings based inference that, that this particular system used with say um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Why might you wanna do this? Well, here's an example that I did uh, of writing, um, I wrote a little program that generates a particular uh, art structure of these blocks that are assembled together and said, okay, now please place a constraint over the output of this program that the structure be stable, right? It's, it has to be in static equilibrium. All of its forces need to be balanced. And if you ask uh, a random walk Metropolis Hastings sampler to draw samples from that posterior, it pretty much, it finds a solution, but it dives right towards one mode and it gets stuck there for a long time, which is not particularly interesting. But if we use something like HMC, where we have uh, gradients that can sort of navigate uh, really uh, sharp contours in that, in that posterior, then uh, we can start to do things like this, where we can basically invent all sorts of wacky structures that I don't think a human designer would have ever been able to come up with, but all of these are actually stable. Uh, and just to, to sort of prove that point, we actually uh, fabricated some of these things and built them. Um, so this, this one is not as complicated as the example I just showed virtually, but we can still you know, create these kind of fun uh, art structures that look a little precarious, but nevertheless actually do uh, are freestanding once you construct them. So that was fun. Um, okay, so that was swapping out the inference engine for, for HMC. We can also uh, look at uh, swapping it out for sequential Monte Carlo, which the, the reason for this is we found if you, if you do this for some of these kind of um, these shape matching problems, where here I have a kind of a simplified uh, generative model of these uh, sort of abstract spaceships, and I have, this is kind of a toy example, but I have a constraint that says I'd like it to look like this particular profile from the front, uh, but it's kind of free to do whatever it wants when you see it from other angles. And it turns out that, that for this particular problem, this, this has some nice properties where sequential Monte Carlo uh, can produce you these, uh, these well-matching results uh, much faster and more reliably than you can with, say, a random walk Metropolis Hastings sampler. Um, so that was nice. And then, you know, we can take this even further and say, well, sequential Monte Carlo is nice, but we're, we're basically making these, um, at every step of the program, we're making these random proposals from the, from the program and then checking to see how well they satisfy our constraints. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could do something better than random proposals? So what if we have proposals that are guided by neural networks that can look at the target image we're trying to match and say, ah, maybe I should go off in this direction instead of go off in this direction. So, um, so we built the system to do that. This was actually written in, uh, in Web People. So this is a, a program that generates these kind of 2D cartoon vines. On the left, we have a version that is using these neural nets, neural net guided proposals, and on the right we have the naive unguided version that's just sampling from the prior. And uh, this, this, this is basically a, a, an apples to apples real time wall, wall clock comparison. The one on the left is about nine times faster than the one on the right, which is a nice speed improvement and, and got us closer to being able to do things at more interactive rates. And really, this is kind of the trend in, in graphics uh, with these kinds of generative models is moving away from iterative optimization and search-based inference to try to get closer to just learning a forward generative model that captures the user's intent directly. So you can sample from it super quickly. Um, so along those lines, this, this brings me to the second point I wanted to mention about a representation, PPLs as a, as a representation of learnable generative models. Um, programs that, that uh, we've have in their forward generative structure have just encoded the intent that we'd like to capture. 
So this is related to, uh, th very strongly related to concept learning from cognitive science. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a, a screenshot I stole from Brendan Lake's recent science paper on uh, learning probabilistic programs that describe hand-drawn characters by taking some set of motion primitives, like little strokes that a person could draw, combining them together into parts, which then combine together into um, higher level objects. This is hierarchical probabilistic generative process for creating, uh, for creating uh, characters. And so we did a similar thing with 3D graphics. We said, well, why don't we have, uh, in this case, I'll, I'll look at spaceships again, because they're always fun to play with. Um, a small number of examples of these spaceships that are built out of a common part library, this thing on the bottom. And you can think of that as being similar to this, this library of motion primitives in the, the concept learning case. Um, and let's, from that, can we, can we learn from this small number of examples uh, a probabilistic program that we can then sample from to spit out a large variety of outputs that look uh, similar to the examples, right? Use the same parts and exhibit the same kinds of spatial relationships. Uh, and the, the, the data representation here, I'm not going to have time to get into uh, how this algorithm works exactly, um, but we end up with these kind of graph structures, these hierarchies that show how the parts are connected to one another, um, and they encode some useful things like uh, Oh, my mouse cursor isn't showing up, unfortunate. Um, like symmetries, so there's, there's a reflectional symmetry in these, these, uh, these wings that are attached to the, the body of the spaceship. Um, and so, you know, we use a lot of optimization and search in the process of creating these programs, but once we've got them, you can just run them forward and spit out um, new results that look hopefully like what the user intended. Um, and so the last point, I don't have too much time left, but the last point is about uh, using PPLs to structure very complicated deep network computations. And this is relevant because in computer graphics, the, the models that we're building to generate visual content are becoming increasingly structured and complex and using lots, of, lots and lots of deep nets because, let's face it, we have lots of high dimensional visual and perceptual data to work with. And so oftentimes, uh, deep neural networks are the best tool for doing that. So this is a pipeline from a paper that I, uh, that my group published earlier this year of uh, this is a generative model for, for creating uh, 3D scenes, indoor, indoor environments like bedrooms and offices and so on. <clears throat> and what this says is basically uh, you start with, uh, with your input scene, which is initially empty, and you have these, these, this chain of different neural networks. One says, should I add objects to this scene or is it done? And if I say, yes, I should add more objects, then okay, which type of object should I pick? Where should it go? Um, how should it be oriented in the scene? There's all these decisions that need to be made. Uh, here's another pipeline, or not quite a pipeline, but p a, par a part of one for generating uh, individual 3D objects where these objects are built out of uh, an assembly of, of primitives that can either be um, connected together by adjacency relationships or they can be um, arrayed in, in a, a symmetry group. So we've got this translational symmetry of, um, of the slats in this chair bottom. There's a rotational symmetry for the, the base of this office chair and then uh, a reflectional symmetry for the arms of this chair. And this generative process, you know, it says like, okay, well, uh, decide what type, of, um, what type of thing I'm generating. Is this an adjacency? Is it a symmetry group? What type of symmetry? Then you have to recursively generate all of these, uh, all of these parts uh, until you finally, you know, bottom out at the leaves of this hierarchy. It's a very complicated process. But if you squint at these things hard enough, um, you know, they really, these pipelines really look like programs. Basically, this is just kind of a, a flow. There's some control flow in terms of making decisions about should I stop or not? What type of thing should I generate next? Um, and as well as a, a lot of data flow that manipulates things like 3D geometry. Um, we currently can't just write them as programs. There's lots of complicated boilerplate that goes into building a model like this. Uh, but it would be nice if you could have, say, a nice probabilistic programming framework that just let you write this the way that it, that it sort of occurs in your head. Um, and in principle, I think this could open up a lot of architectural possibilities that you know, we wouldn't consider if we had to code the whole thing ourselves from scratch. So I only have like a minute left, so I just wanted to mention a couple of interesting future directions uh, in this sort of whirlwind tour of, of ideas. One, one thing we're looking at is moving beyond generating sort of static 3D content to, to content that's actually functional and interactive. So this is a video from uh, a paper at CVPR earlier this year, actually also from MIT, about um, you know, generating these kinds of synthetic traces of human activities in indoor environments. You could use these to train models of human activity recognition. Uh, and yeah, I know that the motions are a little bit uncanny valley. <laughs> Just, um, but we, we, we'd like to be able to, yeah, when I, once I point it out, everybody sees it, right? Um, so we'd like to be able to, 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 to generate these 3D environments that can support these kinds of actions, like environments that don't just kind of look vaguely plausible, but actually are interactive, that allow 
a person to walk around and, and, and perform actions in them. Um, so you might, for example, want to have a generative model that has a simulation of a human agent inside of it. And you know, we know that there have been uh, existence proofs, at least, of probabilistic programming languages that can support things like reasoning over the beliefs and actions of an agent. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is uh, I think that um, there's some interesting opportunities in inverse rendering. So, you know, vision as inverse graphics has always been sort of a, a, a goal that's sort of a holy grail thing that's been out there. Recently, we've started to see actual practical implications of this, or practical implementations of this idea. So this is an um, image from uh, the picture of probabilistic programming language, which was done by uh, Tejas Kulkarni here at MIT, where you have some observed image and you'd like to infer how to render, uh, render in light a, a model of a human face to be able to match that image. Um, now I think there's some really interesting opportunities now that we have things like uh, recently announced uh, real-time ray tracing and NVIDIA's latest lines of graphics cards. So here's an example of kind of a over-the-top example of, of an infinite hall of mirrors effect. being rendered in real time yeah, using one of NVIDIA's new um, RTX graphics out, cards. But I think that and now, now that we can render <laughs> extremely photorealistic looking imagery in real time, this implies the ability to do to inverse render uh, so extremely photorealistic uh, effects in almost real time as well. And I think this will enable a lot of really interesting um, real time or near real time inverse design applications. Um, so, so people might say that's all the time I have. So thanks. Real mirrors. Time for a couple of questions. So, yes, so the question is, wh when will these things be used in industry? When will we be able to buy, for example, IKEA furniture that's been designed in this way? Um, hopefully not too far in the future. So I IKEA is one of the companies that we're trying to work with to incorporate some of these technologies into, into their, their workflow, yeah. Hard to see with the light. Yes. Yeah, that's not something I've looked at, but um, I mean, oh, sorry, yes, thank you for the reminder. The question is, uh, since we looked at things like physical stability as a, as a constraint, uh, have we looked at other kinds of, of physical constraints like aerodynamics? Um, I haven't done that. There's been some work in computer graphics doing this without, uh, from sort of a non-Bayesian perspective. Um, it certainly would be interesting to explore at some point. No reason you couldn't. I mean, these, these systems are all Turing complete, so anything you want to express in principle, you could. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again.